Good morning and uh, or good afternoon or good evening whenever you're watching this welcome and this is session five of our series of webinars called growing up this is part of our gates of the city leadership academy and the purpose of this is to help you grow up it's to help you develop and the first three sessions one two and three were to help you locate yourself where you were in different areas and how to mature yourself and give you that process because at the end of the day the most important thing you can do as a leader for the people you lead is to mature yourself more to grow more and then last week we looked at how to mature others by how we feed them by feeding meat not milk or milk when they need milk and meat when they need meat meat to be more precise so today I want to talk about a slightly larger sort of more bird's eye perspective. What I want to talk about today is creating a culture of maturity. So if you're pastoring a church, running a small group, maybe running a business or even in your own family, we need to create a culture of maturity. Or I also call it a progressive culture, a culture that moves everyone forward. A lot of churches very sad to say, have what I call a regressive culture. Everyone moves backwards. The whole church is always moving backwards. And I'll explain why that happens. So before we go into creating a culture of maturity, we need to stop, press pause, and talk about culture. Because we haven't talked about culture in our Leadership Academy yet, but it's so important. It is so important, okay? What is culture? Culture is very simple. Culture is who we are and how we behave when we get together okay have you noticed that you're slightly different when you're with certain groups of people you know guys if you're going out with your wife's friends it's different than going out with your friends the culture is different okay when i go into one church it's different i'll behave slightly differently than if i go into a different church okay as a guest speaker i i i speak differently in some churches why that's the culture when we get together that there's an expected set of rules of normal behaviors and that's the culture of a business of a church or anything else that's what culture is it's our behaviors and our attitudes when we get together so tree of life one of the things i work at very very hard is to make sure tree of life has its own culture and i work on the culture culture is who we are when we're together and it permeates through that meeting that gathering and it influences everybody so your culture is who you are when you're together. And so we deliberately set our culture and tree of life. But now, now listen, this is so important because a lot of people don't realize this. We, we've had this resurgence in the last 34 years in, in, in church um, leadership about vision, the power of vision. Vision's important. Without a vision, people perish, okay? And so we watch, we, we watch for the Lord. We write the vision. We make it plain. Habakkuk 2-2 and all that. I believe in all of that. I do that. But culture matters more than vision. Why does culture matter more than vision? I'll use tree of life language. Culture matters more than the dream. Why does culture matter more than the dream? Because who we are matters more than where we're going. Okay. Imagine we got to our destination, but we lost our identity. That would be a failure. That would be a, a big fail in your mission. So I, one of my dreams for Dagenham, for Tree of Life Church in Dagenham, is to have a service where there's 3,000 worshippers every Sunday. A mega church with 3,000 worshippers every Sunday. That's one of my dreams. That's part of my dream. But imagine if we got the 3,000 people, but we weren't centered on Christ. We weren't full of the word. We weren't full of the spirit. We weren't full of the nations. We weren't filled with love. Then I'd, I'd, I'd have failed. I don't, I don't want to, I'd rather have uh, 300 people with the right culture than 3,000 people just missing it because culture is more important than vision. Staying who we are is more important than, than, than getting there, being the right people. Who uh, culture is our identity, who we are when we're together. And so I will always keep on the side of becoming and being who God's called us to be rather than getting to where God's called us to be. Now, you don't have to choose, okay? You don't have to choose. But if you, if you have to choose, sometimes you do in certain issues, um, choose culture, okay? And it's an important distinction, and it's one that I think is really, really needs to be emphasized. And so I, I've written a series of statements that define the culture at Tree of Life, and that, that they help guide me make decisions. Now, listen very carefully. Culture in any organization does not happen by accident. So if you're the leader of the group, if you're pastoring the church, 
if you're the head of the family, if you're the CEO of the business, and you do not deliberately change the culture and set the culture, then other people will set the culture for you. And they will be immature people, the loudest people, the most carnal people will set the culture. And I've been in many churches where the culture is not set by the leadership. It's set by the loudest, most rebellious, most unchristian, ungodly, immature people in that church. And therefore the culture is not godly. It's not mature. And you can't create a place where you can do what God's called you to do. And there will always be in any organization on any level, there will always be people, always, always, no exceptions, uh, zero exceptions. There will always be people who want to rip that culture out of your hands as the leader and define it for you. And that is one of your biggest battles as a leader. Now, if you're in a church, you're in a business today, and you're listening to me right now, and you're not the main, main leader, you're not the big boss leader, then one of your main tasks as a leader of a small group, leader of a, a location, leader of this, leader of that, leader of a department, then one of your main char 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 charges, one of your main responsibilities is to maintain the culture set from the top. So what is the culture? Well, it's that tree of life. And so everyone needs to know the culture of where they are and how to define it. And if you're in charge, how to define it. And then everyone knows how to craft the culture. And I'm going to specifically talk about churches today, but it'll apply to anything. You see, let's say you've got a church and a new person comes. One new person comes to that church. Well, that person has brought their own culture. They've brought their own way of doing things to the church They're because of their family, because of the tribe they're in, because of the nationality, because of their community, because of the church they used to go to. And we need to celebrate that and welcome that. But at the same time, you must not let it define what they've come to. You, as the leader, must set the culture. Okay? And as we at Tree of Life are building churches now, network of churches, we're building really what we're building. See, when I say my, my dream is to plant churches and build healthy churches, really what I'm all about is building people. Because you can't have healthy churches without people, and you can't plant new churches without people, and you can't do anything without people. I was speaking to an apostle last night and um, what's your number one problem at the moment? Planting new churches where you are in the world, people, okay? The church is only made up of people. And if we're going to build a healthy, growing church, we need healthy, growing people. And setting the culture actually keeps people healthy. That's why it's so important because an unhealthy culture produces unhealthy people. So one of the basics of our culture, which I'm hoping everyone who goes to Tree of Life is aware of, this is like the, 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 the foundation of our culture, is this. Now, I've summed it up like this. Full of the word, full of the spirit, full of the nations, filled with love, okay? So full of the word. Everything we do in Tree of Life is built in the Bible. We believe the Bible is inerrant. It's inspired. We believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. If you don't know what those words mean, then you need to go and listen to some of my teaching on the Bible. Uh, we believe that our thought processes should change, that we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and our mind should be renewed to Scripture. We believe that when what the Word says contradicts our circumstances and what our senses tell us, then we stand on the Word and live by faith and not by sight. So that reflects our church services. There's a lot of time in our services where we teach the Word. We have sessions like this. We have different things where we're teaching the word. We have a lot of ways in Tree of Life where you can plug in and study the word and know the word better because we want every one of our people to be full of the word. And so when I'm thinking about guest speakers for my conferences and guest speakers for the church, that's one of my priorities. Will they make us fuller of the word? Because some guest speakers won't. They'll just hype us up a little bit. They won't make us fuller of the word. And so that makes a big decision of the spirit you know it's not the will of god that i'm the only person in the church who, who, who flows in the gifts it's the will of god and the will of tree of life that everyone is baptized in the holy ghost everyone speaks in tongues everyone's involved and so we train all our leaders how to get people baptized in the holy ghost how to you know we want all of our leaders to be good friends with the holy spirit so again that affects decisions we make full of the nations you know the idea that you can plant a monocultural church in a multicultural city is, is just wrong. It's just so wrong. A healthy church is built around the gospel. It's not built around a national culture or an ethnicity or an age group. 
So a healthy church will have people from many nations, many cultures, many ages, many walks of life. And so we, I'm so glad we have so many people in Tree of Life from different backgrounds, different cultures. I'm so pleased that our church is a multi-ethnic, with like a coat of many colors, and we really reflect the favor of God there. And, uh, you know, we want to honor people who come to our church about where they come from, what their existing mindset is, and then filled with love. Now, filled with love has affected our structure and how we've made decisions probably more than the other three. How many of you know you can't love a thousand people? You can, can only love a handful of people. You can't really even love a hundred people. So to be a church filled with love, we have to have small groups. You, you can't be filled with love without small groups. And so, you know, been, there's been times when I haven't wanted to have small groups. There's been times when elders have made my life more difficult, you know? And uh, there's been times when small groups have made my life more difficult. There's been, when we first started the church, we only had two small groups. We were a church of 15 with two small groups of six people and a couple of people just didn't go. And one of those small groups left the whole church, the whole church left. The whole small group left the church. Lady wanting to move in with a boyfriend. We said no. And so we, we stood her down as an elder and the whole group left and uh, she did her own thing for a while. So we, we lost half our church because of small groups, but I'm absolutely committed to small groups because that's a cultural decision. I'm more interested in getting the culture right than growing the church huge. No, you get both, but if I have to choose, I will always choose culture. And this is how we change a church, by fighting for culture. And this is how you create a church that changes the world by fighting for culture. Okay, I've said a lot there, um, just in general terms. I haven't even got to my main points yet, but I hope this is helping. I hope this is helping people understand why culture is so important, why we fight for it so hard at Tree of Life, and why I set the culture. And, um, you know, if you've got any questions on that, please ask. Um, I might do a whole module on this kind of stuff, setting culture. It's so important. Um, you know, so if you've got any questions, please ask. If I haven't communicated clearly, please let me know so I can clarify. Um, but let me move on now, and let's specifically talk about building a culture okay that matures people so i'll give you the tools on how to build culture in a second okay we need every church tree of life don't want tree of life specifically but you know your, your situation as well a church that values maturity in the culture and does not value immaturity okay now i've been involved in churches where immaturity is honored okay and maturity is almost despised that's not the way we want to build things because that's going to make leading church hard. And I'll explain this all to you. You know, I was a school teacher for a long time and I was a supply teacher as well. When I started the church, it was easier for me to be a supply teacher. I uh, had more time on my hands to get involved in the church. Some schools have a culture that values maturity, that values learning and others don't. It's all about culture. And it's the same in churches. Some churches you walk in and people want to learn. They want to grow. They want to develop. They want to be disciples. And in other churches, people don't. They're, they're there is a social club. They're there is this. And we have to work on this in every church. You know, we have to, every church needs to build the culture. And if you've got another ministry or you've got business as well, or even your own family, whatever you're called to lead, you need to work on culture. So how to wisely build culture? Well, let me speak, first of all, to those who are senior or will be seniors. You're the pastor of the church. You're the founder of the movement. You're the number one. You sit in the big chair, right? You're ridiculously in charge okay you are ridiculously in charge okay if something is not to your liking it's because you're tolerating it okay you can change it you can change it whenever you want you're in charge and that that's the philosophy i take to tree of life if i don't like it i'm going to change it i'm going to get it right i'm going to sort it now if you're a tree of life pastor if you're running a tree of life and uh, hopefully most of our pastors are in today i don't know um you know if not they'll watch it later i'm sure there's only two people who can override you if you're a Tree of Life pastor at the moment. That's me and Amanda. That's it. Now, we'll probably have an area pastor system in place soon already. So, you know, there's seven churches. is getting a little bit too, uh, you know, we're, we're growing. Um, but at the moment, the only people. So what you do is you say, well, I want to be part of a Tree of Life. So you give up some of your autonomy. You choose to do that, to be part of something larger than yourself. But even then, you're still ridiculously in charge. And so my, my charge to every pastor listening to the sound of my voice right now is this. Build a church you like going to. Build a church. Craft a culture that makes you want to get up and go to church in, on Sunday morning. Okay? Trust me. I am so excited about driving to Trimley tonight. I'm so excited about getting, I'm going to Dagenham tomorrow. I'm so excited about going to Brentwood. I'd be happy to go to any of our Tree of Life churches. I love our churches because I have built the culture. 
And there are times when other people tried to come in and wrest that culture, some deliberately, some just innocently, not knowing anything, but trying to, trying to take a, change things. But Bill, you are in control of the culture. And as we journey, we must always build the culture. Now, remember when we talked about leadership, some of you did our leadership module. And, uh, you know, if you haven't done that, it's all on YouTube. There's about eight hours of teaching on how to be a good leader there. And we described leadership as three things. You've got somewhere to go, a way to get there, and being able to bring people with you. You can't do one of those three things. You're not leading people. Well, that third one is always the one people need the most training on, how to bring people with. Okay, people need to learn communication skills. People need to learn how to handle themselves with charisma. They need to learn how to build trust with people, all those things. Some of those things are intuitive, but most of them can be learned. Most of them can be developed, you know? And if you have a huge dream, it means nothing. Listen, I hate to pop it, but it means nothing if you can't build culture. What is the point of getting somewhere if we lose who we are on the way? What is the point of having a mega church in Dagenham if it's not full of the word, not full of the spirit, not full of the nations, not filled with love? That, that would be terrible. Every organization has a culture. When you go to that group, you behave differently. When I get up after this meeting and I go to the gym, I'm going to behave differently because I'm in a different culture. And a different gym might be totally different. I've been to two gyms mainly uh, in the last five years. And one of them, everyone tidies up after themselves. And it's great. That's what I want to go to now. But the previous gym, people just left weights on the floor, that stuff. And I didn't like that. That's not the culture I want to have. And so I just changed. I'm not going to be able to change the culture of a gym. I don't run the gym. I'm barely there, you know. But in Tree of Life, if I, if I, if I was running that gym, I'd be changing that culture. I'd be building the proper culture. How do you change culture? Let me tell you how to change culture. Let me tell you how to create culture, okay? There are three things you must, skills that create culture. Three skills that create culture. Celebration, write these down if you write notes. These are the three skills that create culture. Celebration, toleration, and castigation. What you celebrate, what you tolerate, and what you castigate, okay? So when someone does something that you want in your culture and you want more of, you celebrate it. When someone does something that you want, don't want more in your culture, but you don't want less of, you just tolerate it. You just, okay, that's fine. When someone does something you want less of in your culture and you don't want more of, you castigate it. You correct it. Okay? What you celebrate will grow in your culture. What you tolerate will stay at the same level. And what you castigate is reduced in your culture. Sometimes I'll correct someone. So why do you correct that person? Because I do not want that in my culture. That is not the culture we're building. Culture is created by what you celebrate, tolerate, and castigate. That is probably the most important sentence in culture building that you need, okay? Now, in most churches, and I'm not criticizing anybody here, but it's just the truth. In most churches, the culture is very invisible. You cross a cultural line, and you don't know about it until people start tutting and disapproving, okay? We need to be clear as our culture. And as a leader, you need to be clear about, this is what we're like. This is what our church is like. This is what we celebrate in Tree of Life. This is what we put up with. This is what we will not put up with. This is what we will not take. Now, a lot of pastors don't know how to celebrate things, okay? The, uh, some pastors don't know how to tolerate things. And most pastors do not know how to castigate properly. They don't know how to correct someone. And the main reason most pastors are not setting culture is they do not know or they're uncomfortable correcting or castigating something. But that is an, listen, that's an essential part of making disciples. How could you ever possibly make a disciple without correcting someone? How could somebody possibly learn a new skill without someone correcting them as they do it? How could you possibly part, be part of a group of people, be part of a church, and, and not have someone say, look, that's not how we do things at Tree of Life. That's not how we do things in Grace Life. That's not how we do things in our church. That's not how we do things at Grace and Faith Church. That's not how we do things in this church. And we need to know that when you castigate someone, when you correct someone, you're not condemning them. You're not beating them up. It's what the King James Bible calls reproof. Okay, you want a King James word. It's part of our job as pastors to castigate bad behavior, behavior that we don't want in our churches. You need to make your church a place you like to go to. And if there's behavior going on you don't like, you need to correct it. You need to deal with it. You're the senior. Now, if you're not the senior, but you're involved in leadership and you're involved in the church, then celebrate what your pastor celebrates, tolerate what your pastor tolerates, and castigate what your pastor castigates. You know, I want to make every one of you, you know, the best celebrator of people and the best corrector of people in the world. Okay? 
Now we can talk about that in very general terms, can't we? About different elements of culture. But let's be specific and let's talk about maturity today. Okay, I've had to lay a lot of foundation to get where we're going here. Building a culture of maturity. We've had to talk about what's culture, we've had to talk about how to build a culture. There's all very helpful things that you can take these in any direction you want. And so what, what, what I'm calling today as part of our growing up course, a culture of maturity, what I normally call, I normally call it a progressive culture, a culture that enables a church to move forward. Okay. Churches should naturally move forward. They're alive. They're living organisms. They should naturally grow. People should naturally come to them. People should be attracted to them. They should just grow. If it's not growing, something's wrong. And normally it's in the culture. Okay. So how do we create a progressive culture? Okay. Well, I want to look at something called the Pareto principle. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have heard of it. Maybe you've heard it under a different name, the 80-20 rule. Okay. And what the 80-20 rule says, and it's been proven across a whole range of situations, it's, it's, it's almost invariable, is that in any given situation, 80% of the task takes 20% of the effort, and the other 20% of the task takes 80% of the effort. So if I get you to, um, if I ask someone to build a new website for the church, to get to 80% good, it's going to take 20% effort. To get 100% good, it's actually going to take, <laughs> that, that last 20% is going to take the rest of the 80% of effort, okay? So in any given church, 20% of the people do 80% of the serving. And some of you are doing the math in your head right now. Oh my goodness, that's true. 20% of the people in your church do 80% of the giving. 20% of the people in your church cause 80% of the problems. 20% of the people in the church will take 80% of your time. So if you imagine that 80-20 rule, you've got the top 20% of your church, okay? They're the superstars. They're the ones that do all the serving, all the giving. They're the faithful ones. They're the ones who are never late for church. They're never walking late. They never miss church. You don't need to, there's certain people, I don't need to ask myself, will they be there tomorrow morning? They're going to be there because they're superstars. They're always going to be there. If they're on a rotor, I don't need to text them tonight and go, you're definitely coming tomorrow to make the tees because I know they're going to be there to make the tees. I've got other people on rotors. I need to double check and triple check they're coming because they're not superstars. Okay. If we hold a conference, these are people who are registered first, ready to come. What help do you need? They're, they're, they're proactive and asking me for help. These guys are the top 20% of your church. Every church, 20% of your people, one in five, are superstars. That's just how church works. They're superstars. They're your top people. They're mature. And if you look at their lives, they're superstars at home. They're superstars in their business. They're superstars at work. They're not moved by earthly things. They're mature. They calm their own storms. They walk by faith. They forgive people who offend them. They are the very low maintenance people, very low drama people. They're your top 20%. I love those people. No. You also got your other 20% at the bottom. Okay, now there's a number of words we could use for them. Uh, not all of them are polite, not all of them should go on YouTube. So I'm going to choose the word drain because they're drains, they drain you as church leaders. Okay, oh, they're faithful too, faithful to try and make every situation about them. They're the ones who want to know who's speaking when at your conference because I don't want to listen to all the speakers, I just want to listen to the one I like. I just want to listen to my favorite speaker. They're going to get offended. You know, I always find those people funny because they really, really want to know who's speaking when, but they're going to get upset no matter who speaks. No matter who's preaching, they're going to get upset. They're the ones who never turn up when they're supposed to. They're, they're, not, they're, they're the ones that are on the rotor and aren't there. They're the ones who aren't serving, aren't helping, aren't giving. You'll find they've put five pounds in in the last year. I always wonder about that when people have five pounds in the offering the last year. They give it by accident. Well, you know, was, it, was it a mistake? Because it just seems so bizarrely inconsistent. You know, the whole team, the whole team, that, you know, if the Teas and Coffees team or the Deacons team, you, the, the team's covering for them and everyone on the team knows it. They are the people who make pastoring hard work. Okay, I love them. I love them, but they're real. Okay, this is leadership talk right now. This is real talk. This is what every church is like. You have your top 20% and you're you 80 and you're at your bottom 20% and you're 80 above them. Now, that is the makeup of every single church. Anywhere in the world, pick a church, and it's very close to those ratios. It really is. Now, 
that's the people you've got to deal with. Why am I telling you that? Because you need to decide in advance what kind of people do you want to be? What kind of people do you want this church to be? Now, if you've agreed to be part of Tree of Life, then you've already agreed, I want to be a Tree of Life person. So you've made a choice to grow up already. But now we're in the church, and I, as the leader, have to make a choice. How do I make this church a progressive church, a maturing church, a growing up church, and not a growing down church? There are some churches where, honestly, if you go, you're going to get dumber. You're going to get more immature by the time you're finished. You spend a year there, you're going to be less of a disciple of Jesus than when you started. Now, Bible college, listen to me very carefully, and I love my Bible college, and I love what they taught me, but they taught me to help churches move backwards. What they taught me to do makes a church move backwards, okay? And what they taught me to do was you invest in that bottom 20%. You invest in the drains, okay? You take them out for dinner. They're the squeaky wheel. They're the toddlers in the church. They need all the help. Love them, invest in them, help them, serve them, get involved in them. But you see, what happens is if I, as the leader, aim at the bottom 20%, then what happens is this. I'm now celebrating immaturity. And what you celebrate, you cause to increase in your culture. And therefore, the whole culture of the church is dragged down. In other words, you've got your 20% at the bottom, your 20% at the top. So in the middle, you've got the 60%, yeah? They're the wannabes. Right? They just want to be. They want to be where the action is. They want to be where things are happening. They just want to be in your church. Now, if they see, hey, pastor loves the people who make the noise. Pastor pays attention when the babies throw the toys out of the pram. Pastor loves the squeaky wheel. Well, we'll just, con we'll, we'll, we'll just work on being squeaky wheels. And now the whole church is coming down. The whole church knows to get my attention, the best thing to do is to be as immature as possible. You want me to come and visit on Monday? Skip church on Sunday, because on Monday, I visit all the people who skip church. I go and see how they're doing and make sure they're okay and make sure they're not offended and make sure they're babies. So then people actually skip church on Sunday to get past to visit on Monday. I've seen it. I've seen it with my old denomination. That's what happens. Not always, but it does happen. <sighs> so what you have to do is celebrate what you want to grow. Celebrate maturity. You have to tolerate what you're ambivalent about and castigate what you don't want. Now, it becomes a problem when it comes to immaturity. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, for example, let's say you're a pastor and your church has a problem with punctuality, right? So, what do you do? You celebrate being on time. You start your service on time. Okay, you don't wait for everyone to mill around and get that you start on time. You start with a big, explosive, good thing. Start with a countdown. Start with a yell. Start with a cheer of Jesus. Start with something that when people don't turn up on time, they've missed it. You celebrate and you give the best of people who arrive on time and arrive early. Now, you tolerate people coming in late. You don't want them not to come in. Okay, so you tolerate that. You don't, you know, you don't cast together. You don't correct someone for walking in the door five minutes late. But... What is he? So me as a, as a leader, this is my, my, my definition. I celebrate the people who arrive on time. I tolerate people who come in late because, you know, I'd rather they came in, and, you know. But what I won't tolerate, what I castigate, is people who turn up late when they're supposed to be serving. Okay? I can't have an usher turn up late. So that I will actually speak to that person and correct or ask the deacon to speak to and correct. So look, if you're going to be an usher, then you need to turn up on time. We, we had that um, with a couple of our departments for quite a while. People didn't realize the value of turning up on time when they're supposed to serve on a Sunday. So that had to be dealt with. Okay, part of our culture at Tree of Life is full of the word, full of the word. We want people to fill the word. So we celebrate the word. We celebrate it today. You're at Leadership Academy. We celebrate living by faith. We celebrate standing on the word. Now we tolerate people who are empty of the word because if they don't come, how are they going to get filled? Okay, so we tolerate that. We want you to come empty. If you come from some tradition where they never filled you with the word or you're a newborn Christian, we're glad you're here. And we'll get you filled. We're not going to correct you for not being full of the word. We're going to just let that be. Okay, some situations you let be and you let people get filled with the word. But I will not tolerate and I will not put up with nonsense teaching that cuts against the word, that stops people seeing the word. And there's all sorts of traditions out there and the charismatic church is worse for them all that make the word of God of no effect. So I will not tolerate that and I will not allow that and I'll correct that if it rears its ugly head in tree of life. That's really important. So you decide, I want this in my culture. Well, what do I, what do I celebrate? What do I tolerate? Because there's some things you have to tolerate, okay? You have to tolerate immature people 
because you want immature people in your church. You want new Christians. You want people who don't know what they're doing. You don't want your church, you know, how are they supposed to get mature if they don't come to you? And what are you going to correct? Where is the line? You're going to say, I'm going to draw the line here and correct this. Okay, but here's the issue. Here's the complication with, with, with this system. It's a great system, but here's the complication when it comes to immaturity. And you've heard me say this before in this course. Here's the complication. You can't correct immaturity. Immature people can't be corrected. That's part of being immature. Okay, you can't get a three-year-old and yell them. Why have you not mowed the lawn? Why haven't you gone and got a job? Why haven't you given me grandchildren yet? Why don't you? You can't do that. They're, they're, they're just going to cry. <laughs> Either they're going to try and correct it and they can't because they're just not able, or they're just going to be frustrated and upset and offended, you know, disappointed, whatever it is. They're going to try and please you and they can't because they can't do that yet. They're going to get annoyed at themselves. Or they're just not going to want to try and they're going to get annoyed at you. Either way, they're just getting frustrated, annoyed, angry. You can't correct immaturity. You feed the immature. You don't correct them. So in, in the church, in any church, in any system, business, whatever, you can't, you can only tolerate immaturity. You can't castigate it. Okay. But what we must never do, and this happens, this happens in so many churches. We must never celebrate immaturity. And the tragedy we have right now in 2021 is our whole culture in the West is shifting to a celebration of immaturity. So the whole culture, every culture, everything is shifting to the celebration of the immature. And so you want to create a culture of maturity, celebrate the mature. So when I sat down with my pastors this week, I said, tell me someone who was outstanding this week. And so I had a little note and just send them a little note. Why? To celebrate the mature. And then when you celebrate the superstars, who, to be honest, don't really need it. But the whole church then goes, you know where pastor is? He's up here celebrating these guys, celebrating the favor. This is the way I'm going to be. And then the whole church starts to move that way. And what happens is, let's say you get another 10 people, right? Let's say you've got a church of 100. So you've got 20 superstars, right? You've got 60 wannabes and 20 drains. That's your church of 100. That's what your church is, okay? Give or take one or two people. Now, let's say you create this progressive culture. Guess what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen, right? 10 of your wannabes are going to become superstars because that's awesome. They just love it. And they're going to grow into that. Now you've got 30 superstars. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to get an extra 10 people at the other end. It's the whole thing just grows. The principle stays the same. So you create as many superstars as you can, and there's suddenly there's a whole bunch of new people coming to your church. It, it really is that simple. And then you create more superstars out of them, and then new people come. Really, this is so important, okay? So if you want to create a culture of maturity, what do we do? Specifically, create a culture of maturity. Number one. Grow up yourself. You have to grow up. That's our first key. You must live what you want. You have to have what you want other people to get. You got to get it yourself. I'll give you an example. Part of our culture at Tree of Life is we don't have inaccessible leadership. Everyone in the church has access to my phone number. Now, if you misuse it, I'll block you. I don't mind. But I never let you build trust. I start with trust. And if you unbuild it, that's that's your, that, that, that's, our, that's my principle. Okay. I trust first. I don't make you earn trust. I trust first. You can break it. You can unearn it, but you don't need to earn it to start off with. We're going to start with the fact, I'm going to assume that I can trust you. Okay. Now, as we grow, I may have to put some, you know, structures in place, um, but the culture won't change overall. You know, Wendell Parr, last time he came to Tree of Life, said I'm the most accessible pastor he's ever met. And I think that's a real compliment. One, because that's part of my culture and part of what I want. And two, because it's Wendell. You know, if he says it's because of now, because I am that accessible and because I give out that trust, I can't imagine one of my pastors, one of my team, suddenly turning up at the end of the worship service, having missed the worship, because that's just for you plebs, and turning up with bodyguards with sunglasses, and you know, because that's not the model that I've built. Modeling is the initiation of all discipleship. Okay? Discipleship is just doing what someone else is doing. So if no one's doing it, there's no discipleship. You will never have, listen, if you're the pastor, your church will never flow in the gifts if you don't. They just won't. You are the thermostat for the church. You set the pace. Now, the more you mature, the more you live by faith, the more you hold earthly things lightly, the more you're not talking about others, the more you dominate your emotions, not dominated by them, then people have got something to copy. Okay? And then that's the, that's the, that's the first key and the most important key. At no point do I ever want anything I've taught in this module 
to be you sitting there judging all the people in your church. No, it's about you looking at yourself. How can I be as mature as possible? How can I handle this situation as maturely as possible? How can I locate myself? How can I build myself? How can I feed these people meat? How can I love these people more? That's what it's all about. It's so we can serve more people, love more people, help more people. So number one, grow up. Number two, actively celebrate maturity. Okay? So publicly, thank mature people. Don't thank them for being mature, because the immature will get offended. But you say, man, this guy today, this is Jimmy. Jimmy's in our church. Jimmy got sick this week. But you know what Jimmy did? He stood on the word. He held earthly things lightly. Okay? I just want to give Jimmy a round of applause right now. And you're celebrating maturity. Everyone else now knows this is what you do when you're sick. You don't whinge and moan and whine. You do what's celebrated in that culture. Get excited when people grow up and live maturely and live responsibly. Share their stories, you know. And this is not happening in a lot of churches. A lot of churches are celebrating the immature. They're putting all their time, all their energy, and all their praise into the immature. Okay? They focus on the squeaky wheel. Rather than go up and say, let's celebrate Jimmy for fighting that sickness. We go, this is um, other Jimmy, Jimmy too. Okay? And... Um, Oh man, he's he's been really battling this week. He's he's been sick and it's getting worse. And he he says that the doctors have said this and this and this and this. Let's all pray for Jimmy. And everyone prays out of pity. Oh Jesus! Oh you! And they're just celebrating immaturity. They're celebrating someone who refuses to stand against sickness, refuses to standing on the word of God. And 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 here's the temptation for pastors. Here's the temptation for leaders: is that the mature will keep coming even when you don't celebrate them. Because they're mature. They never came for a thank you. They never came for a celebration. So there's no immediate reward for celebrating them. So the immature pastor or the pastor who's immature in understanding culture, let's say, will always keep on with the squeaky wheel, keep on with the squeaky wheel, look after the squeaky wheel, become the union rep for the squeaky wheel when the pastor's actually genuinely building culture. And the squeaky wheel will therefore never grow up. Pointing at a toddler does not mature them. Growth does. Feeding them does. So the toddler goes, I don't want to eat my vegetables. Of course they don't. It takes sacrifice, it takes effort. They're not as yummy as ice cream. So you've got to give that toddler a reason to eat their vegetables. And what do you do as a parent? You celebrate them when they eat their vegetables. You correct them. You castigate them when they don't. And then they eat their vegetables. That's what you do. And you find a method of celebration and castigation that works for that kid. You raise your child in the way they should go so they eat their vegetables and don't just eat ice cream all day. But why should that toddler eat his vegetables when you give him a round of applause for eating ice cream? Why should someone come to church on Sunday when you go around the house on Monday every time they miss church on Sunday and you give them their own personal audience and preach the sermon to them? You spend more time helping them than they spend helping themselves. Why will they ever help themselves? And you think you're being a good leader and you think you're being Christian and kind or you're bad leadership. You're not helping the immature. You're not changing anyone's lives and you're diminishing the entire church and pulling it down. We must learn the skill of celebrating the culture we want, specifically here in maturity. If you want something in your culture, celebrate it. Culture is simply nothing more than the behaviors that you as leadership celebrate, tolerate, and castigate when you're together. And if you learn those skills, how to celebrate, how to tolerate, and how to castigate, you will have a good culture. Now, what's essential is you want a progressive culture. You want a culture that enables your church to move forward. 20% of people in your church are superstars, 20% are drains. They suck the life out of you. That's, that's a universal principle. And the other 60%, they're just going to go with the flow. They're largely passive. They're going to go with the flow. If you spend all your time on the squeaky wheel and all your time helping the people who need the most help and loving them and helping them being super pastor, super kind man, you are going to create a backwards, regressive, immature church that doesn't grow. And the whole church is going to start magnifying problems because that's how they get your attention. When you start celebrating success and you start celebrating maturity and you invest in that and you praise that, then the whole church starts moving up. More people come. Everyone starts growing. You have to decide what is mature behavior. Define it, model it, and then celebrate it. How do you celebrate? Praise. You praise people privately, publicly, and indirectly. Okay? So privately, you take someone aside and say, I really admire the way you did that. That was a great prophetic word. You started where God started. You stopped where God started. And that was great. Awesome. Now, some might give a word sometimes on the Sunday. It's a bit flat. Okay? It's not, it's not wrong. It's not doctrinally wrong. It's not judgmental. It's, not, it's just flat. Okay, we had that a few weeks ago. Somebody gave a word, and it was just a scripture, it was just a bit flat, and it was just there was nothing life to it. Okay, now I didn't celebrate it, I didn't go, Wow, what an awesome word! That was great. 
and I didn't at the same time I didn't correct it because it wasn't wrong it wasn't nasty it was, you know, I don't I don't I don't want to correct people getting up and giving them giving a word so but I just tolerate it I just let it go okay that's what I mean by tolerate there's some things you just tolerate okay but when you want to promote something when you want something bigger in your culture number one praise pub privately that was great well done publicly hey everyone just want to celebrate this person what they did this week and then indirect praise okay indirect praise is like reverse gossip okay i noticed ashley's here i've just seen him on the the thing that a pastor of the church croydon so let's say somebody in croydon did a great job and i, and I noticed it well I, I, I might not phone them i might phone ashley and say ashley do you know such and such in your church man they did such a good job i was so impressed blah 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 blah, blah. i guarantee for next time Ashley meets that person, first thing out of his mouth is, do you know Ben said this about you? Man alive. Indirect praise. It's like reverse gossip. It's awesome. Everyone should be involved in indirect praise. Okay, so praise. Number two, promote. Okay, you give the superstars the jobs to do. Don't give the job. I felt sorry for that person, so I made them the head usher. You know, I let them preach because they really wanted to. No, you promote the superstars, you promote the faithful, you promote the people who are involved, and then you thank them publicly for doing the job. Number three is participate, you participate. Get involved in the life of your superstars, take them out for lunch, visit them at work, spend time with them. When you do this, the passive people in the church, that middle 60%, they'll start to realize, hey, pastor loves consistency, he loves service, he loves wisdom, he loves maturity. Let's get there, and the whole church is now progressing. If you don't want that in your culture, don't celebrate it. What you celebrate will multiply. What you praise will increase. What you take part in will be more. Pay for. Put some money behind maturity. Okay? I'm taking all the mature people out for dinner and I'm paying for it. There you go. Or whatever. And then finally, parade. What you put out in public is what people want to be. Okay? So that's the skill of celebration. Hopefully that helps everyone. What's the skill of toleration? Because we have to tolerate immaturity. I don't want more immaturity in the church but i don't want less in the sense of i don't want someone who's a new christian or someone who's come from a church background where they don't know how to live by faith they don't know how to do things leave the church i want new christians in the church i want baby christians in the church i don't even mind there being 40 year old christians you know who've been christians for 30 years 40 years old and they're still babies i don't mind that because they're growing because they come so i tolerate them okay I don't criticize them. I don't celebrate them at the same time. We just let it pass. Sometimes that's hard for pastors. We want to we want to put our opinion on everything. No, just shut your mouth sometimes. Tolerate is basically means ignore. You just ignore it. And one of the things you need to do, listen, every one of you is in leadership here, and some of you are going to be in leadership soon, trust me. Okay? You want to make sure your leadership team knows the same. Listen, that behavior there was quite immature. I'm not going to correct that person, but I'm not going to celebrate it. I'd like you all to do the same. Okay? Again, you can't correct immaturity. You can't scream at a three-year-old for not mowing the lawn and expect them to go and do it. They're not mature enough. They're not big enough. They can't grab the lawn mower. They don't know what they're doing. New Christians do not have renewed minds. They don't have ability to access the grace of God. They don't have the power to live what you consider normal Christianity. So what do you do? You feed them. You love them. You don't celebrate the immaturity. You celebrate the people. You love the people. Okay? You don't want people staying immature, but you don't castigate it or correct it because otherwise they'll stop coming. Let's say a couple come to your church next Sunday, okay, this Sunday, right? Couple come to your church, new couple, and they're living together, okay? They're not married and they're living together. They might have a kid or two. Now, that's not wickedness, not normally, okay? It's, it's immoral. It's sexually immoral. It's sinful. I'm not saying it's not sinful, okay? But I, 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 I try and look at things. Is this immaturity or is this wickedness? Okay, so a couple who don't know Christ or they're new Christians, they've never understood anything about Jesus, and they're living together as man and wife, they're not man and wife, that's immature, you know. The evangelist has got a different girl in every church, that's wicked, that's evil, okay. That needs to be stood up against and uh, dealt with and castigated. But I'm not going to correct this couple. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore it. I'm not going to celebrate the fact they're living together because it's sinful. I don't want more of that in the church. I don't want my teenagers in the church raised in Christian families going, well, that's okay then. Uh, you know, if they're in the worship band, I can just go, no, no, no. They, they won't get promoted by me. They won't get platformed by me. I won't be participating. I won't be paying for what they're doing. Okay, I'm not involved in it, but I'm not going to correct it either. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, I'm just going to love them and bless them. I'm not going to bring it up. It's more important to me at that stage, they learn how to eat. They learn how to feed. Can they read the Bible for themselves? So they're in a living church. You tolerate that immaturity. Nobody's the same as you. Nobody's your clone. 
And if you're the leader, people are going to assume you're the most mature, whether you are or not. So you tolerate it, and then other people tolerate it too. Okay? And so people are going to take a while to grow up. Okay? People are going to take a while to get there. And then what happens is, you know, somewhere down the road, they're going to come to you and he's going to go, you know, I'm really good at the guitar. Can I, can I get up the front? And I'm going to say, well, actually, no. And the reason is this, the two of you need to be married. In the tree of life, we only let married people, we don't let people who are living together, not married, in the worship band. Oh, why? Well, let me give you a teaching on marriage. Now, because they've been at the church six months, nine months, we've loved them and loved them and loved them. We love them. We put, spoke the truth inside love. We put love first. Then we've built a bridge. And now we can get the information across to them. Now we can talk to them, have a serious conversation. And then they say, do you know what? We need to get married. Yes, you do. That's right. But they've grown up to the point where they can get married now. If we'd made them get married nine months ago and said, you better get married. You're living in sin. You better get married right now. Then either they're going to leave the church annoyed at us or they're going to get married and just hate themselves because they're, they're, they're doing it out of a very immature place. So we don't celebrate people running off ahead, but we don't come down like a ton of bricks. One of our pastors, I won't name names, got one Sunday and said, every penny raised in this offering is going to go to world mission. And we didn't have the savings we have right now. We didn't have the cash flow that we have right now. And I was like, and then he phoned me and went, I just gave all the money to world vision. And I thought, wow, I'll just pay your salary out of thin air, shall I? I'll just pay for the whole hire out of thin air. And I thought it, but I didn't correct it. It was an immaturity. It wasn't a wickedness. It's not wicked to take all the money and give it to world mission. That's not wicked. Okay, it was done from a good place with a real pure heart and a generous heart. And I'm not going to correct it because it's just immaturity. It wasn't evil. A few weeks later, the pastor contacted me and said, man, that was really dumb. That was not the way forward. I said, I, so I told him very gently where I was at with the whole thing. And, you know, there's more bills than just world mission. And he said, I'm going to take a very special offering today. I said, who for? He said, tree of life. You know, I could have come down like a ton of bricks, but it wasn't evil. It wasn't selfish. It was just someone learning how to do something. You can't beat someone up for learning. And you can't overgive anyway. So, I mean, it was done from a good heart and God blessed us. And it's probably part of the reason why we're so wealthy today as a church. But you have to, as a leader, you have to discern the difference. Okay. There's one of our churches right now. There's two people doing the same behavior. The behavior is identical. But one of those people is very immature, very broken, very lost. They need feeding. So I tolerate their behavior because immaturity. The other one is very deliberately scheming to play people in the church off of other people so they can create a little space for themselves so they can grab some leadership, okay? That's not immaturity, that's wicked. And so I emailed them and I said, this behavior stops now. In fact, you cannot attend Tree of Life until I've taken you out for lunch, my treat, and we've discussed this behavior and we talk about it and I tell you what my expectations are for you coming to our churches. That's called castigation, okay? And it's an important part of leadership. But I haven't talked much on that today because you can't castigate immaturity. And the whole point of this is talking about immaturity. You can castigate spiteful, nasty, selfish, ungodly behavior. You can castigate people if they should know better. Okay. I remember talking to one of my children just not that long ago when they were in their late teens. They said, you're talking to me like I'm a toddler. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'd never talk to you like this if you were a toddler, because what, what good would it do? You can change your behavior. I'm talking to you like a teenager. I don't expect you to act like a toddler because you're not a toddler. You should know better than this. You're bigger than this. You're more mature than this. And again, there's some people in the church, they do things, you, know, you should know better than that. And we need to have conversations. If, you're gonna, if it's part of our jurisdiction, it's going to affect our church. We love the person. But if it's immaturity, you know, what can you do? You know, if, if someone's molly if you've got someone in your church who's molly coddling the babies, you know, and every time you, every time you preach and feed them something more than just the thinnest of, you know, skim milk, and that person turns up and goes, oh, pastor doesn't mean that, and this and that, and that, you know, you correct that. How dare that person do that? You know, someone becomes a union rep for the babies in the church. You know, someone's encouraging people in your church to skip church. We had this in one of our churches. Some, oh, don't go to church. It's not that good. Or only go when this person preaches, not when that person preaches. Man, that's not baby behavior. That's nasty. That needs to be corrected. Okay. And you're, you're trying to tell people to respond badly to, to church discipline or don't go to leadership academy or get in the pit with people and get pitiful with them. You know, no, stand. And having done all stand, that's what we should be encouraging people to do. And so as a leader, as a leader, you have to learn how to say no. Every one of you needs to listen to my Building Fences conference, and you need to listen to the session where I teach you on how to say no. 
Um, you need to learn to shut down what you don't want. And if other people in the church are making people more immature or interfering with the growth of others, if you're the leader, you need to stop it. Build a church you're happy coming to. One of our pastors really struggled. He's not with us anymore. Um, but he had a real struggle. This is in one of our churches. And it was, it was not, a grow, not a big church, about 20 people. And they had about 12 people in the choir. So imagine that. You've got a church of 20 and over half the people at the front singing, right? And so they hadn't practiced together. They didn't have the time to practice together. So they didn't have the skill to have 12 people singing, okay? So it looked silly, first of all, and it didn't sound right, second of all. And so I told the pastor, can you deal with this, please? Okay, one musician, one leader, one singer. That's your max until you hit 50 people, and then we can change it, okay? And uh, in the end, he just couldn't do it. So in the end, I did it. And uh, one conversation I had, and I solved the whole problem in one conversation. And then we had other people coming to one of our churches who would only come to church when they were in the worship team, okay? So if they were leading worship, they were in the service. If they weren't leading worship, they weren't in the service, okay? That, that's the picture-perfect illustration of someone who has zeal for their room, okay? We need to be like Jesus, John 2, 17, zeal for the house consumed him. Always be wary of someone who loves their room but doesn't love the whole house. Okay, and you can see that behavior quite obviously. That's disloyalty. That's, that's part of disloyalty. And so we stopped that and we said, if you miss your service when you're not leading worship, you're off the team for a month. Okay, and that's easily enforceable. I mean, that's really easily enforceable because you're in charge. That's how castigation works because that kind of behavior is platforming immaturity. I've had to take a stand and castigate certain behaviors, false prophetic words, people behaving badly, people treating other church people badly, people disrupting services. And, um, you know, we're part of a family. And so if you're in leadership at Tree of Life, especially even if you're not, you're watching this and, you know, you want my help, I'm willing to help, you know. And um, we, 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 I want to help everyone learn these skills because you need them. And I haven't always, always got it right. You know, you need to learn your place as well. You need to learn what's jurisdiction. I taught a whole conference on that a few years ago. Um, what you're in charge of, what you're not in charge of, what you can do, what you can't do. You know, but if you're a pastor at Tree of Life, you're in charge of that service, Living Church, Celebration Church. You're running that, so you're in charge. How people treat other people in that service, that's on you. How people treat you is on you. There are certain people, I don't let, I, I'm not going to let you speak to me like that. You're the leader. Be the leader. No, you're not in charge of what people do at home or they do actually. We, we had a situation. This, this, this illustrates jurisdiction. Um, we had a lady and um, she got up in the middle of a church service, was very disruptive. And um, this was back in Harmony House, back in Harmony House a long time ago. But she was disrupting the whole service, making so much noise. I said, excuse me, sister, can you sit yourself down? And one of our deacons went and got her to sit down. And um, she sat there, obviously getting more and more and more offended until it just came out of her. And she got up and she started cursing me. She was standing right in the middle of the, the congregation. I was in the middle of preaching. And she starts cursing me and cursing the whole church. And I said, listen to me right now. I said, you utter another curse word to me in this room, which I'm paying the bill for, and I will send the bill to you. You have no authority here to speak to me like that. You'll sit down and shut up or you'll leave the room. And uh, when we left the church, she was on the street cursing us nothing I can do. I don't, I don't own the street. I didn't pay for the street. I don't own her mouth. I don't own her thoughts. I'm not in charge anymore. I was in charge of her behavior in the service. But outside, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've called the police on people in church services before. Because I'm not having a service I don't like going to. I've shut down a service, sent half the people home, and then had another service. I'm not going to have a service I don't like. That's how we need to be. You celebrate the maturity, you, 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 you tolerate immaturity, and then anything that's trying to make people more immature, anything that's trying to distract from what's feeding people, you correct it and you deal with it. And this way you create a progressive culture. Now, when someone's on the street like that, when someone's at home, away from the church, or I'm leaving this church, um, how they relate to each other outside of church, what they're thinking inside their mind, I'm not in charge of your thoughts, I don't have authority over your thoughts, there's only one thing you can do. You might be the greatest apostle of all time, but all you can do is say, my brethren, I beseech thee, I'm begging that you don't think like this. But when it is in your jurisdiction, you don't beg, you say, you, you get out of the church, you do this, you do this, this is how it's going to be run. Thank you. Okay, and I'm not saying you don't listen to others, I'm not saying you're not uncorrectable or whatever else, but you have to be the one who sets the culture, or the loudest, most immature people in the church will set it. And so make a choice today. I'm going to breed a culture of maturity. Um, some of you um, 
you know, you come to church faithfully, you've listened to everything I've said today, you're not a pastor, you know, the majority of people listening to this are not pastors, but hopefully by seeing the other side of the curtains can help you appreciate what's being done, help you appreciate what's going on, and you can help set a positive culture, you can help be part of that great culture, and choose to breed maturity, and create a progressive church that's going to grow, impact, make disciples, and change the world. Amen. Awesome. Praise God. I've got two minutes left. Um, I've got one question here. Okay. Um, We've got Bill and Susanna asking a question here. How would you respond to an unmarried couple staying in a home, allowed to sleep together or separate rooms? Well, this is my personal opinion. Again, I have no jurisdiction of what happens in other people's homes. I wouldn't let them in the house because when you go to bed, what's going to happen? Okay. And so I've offended people before. I said, no, you can't stay in my house. You want to stay in a hotel? Go and stay in a hotel. But this is my house. And sexual immorality does not happen in my house. And uh, so I wouldn't even um let them stay that's that's my opinion that that's the way i would handle it um come around come around for dinner whatever else but you know you know uh, you know as soon as you go to bed someone's gonna sneak out sneak in there's gonna be people wandering around the house and you know and i sleep so soundly you never i'm never gonna know what's happening in the morning but i'm responsible for that and i don't want to be seen to be selling right now i don't want to be seen to be part of that and you know so that that, that that's how, how i would handle that situation um, because I don't want to be seen celebrating that. Of course, we tolerate it. Of course, we, we've got several unmarried couples at Tree of Life at the moment. I love them. I love them all my heart. Um, what can I do to help you get married is the question I want to ask. How can, I, how can I get you to where you need to be? And a lot of times they're not ready to get married. They're not ready to stand up against the whole stream of the world and the whole sexual culture coming downstream. But when it clashes with me and my house and my life, and I've got four kids, um, you know, um, I mean, the, the young men are men now, you know, they live in their own houses. If they want to do what they want, they, they don't. They're, they're very, you know, very wonderful, godly men. Um, but I, I would never want to set an example for them. I say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, Uncle Jack and his girlfriend are staying over for the night. Oh, they're going to be in separate rooms. You know, I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be tolerating that, um, even in the same house. You know, what, what they do in their own times up to them, we're still going to love them and meet them, whatever else. But my house is my house, and I'm very protective of my house. You know, maybe that's because there's a lot of things in my um, life I can't control. But I'm very protective of my house. And uh, so that, that, that's where I'm at on that one. Any more questions, people? Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. Book a hotel. Go get a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not paying for the hotel. <laughs> awesome. Praise God. You know, and, and that, that, that's where it comes down to, um, you know, don't participate in another man's sins. Don't, don't get involved. But that doesn't mean you've got to go and correct them and yell at them and scream at them. You know, it's not, that's not the same. Okay. Most of that is immaturity because we live in this world where nobody is taught differently. No one understands differently. And so we need to love and love and love and love and feed and feed and feed until we get to mature. Oh, I need to do something about this. You know, there was, there was a couple in our church and you know, they, they got upset. I said something about sexual morality in the sermon. I wasn't aiming at them. They felt I was aiming at them. Um, I wasn't, they got upset. They left the church. They came back, they left the church. They came back. Um, and eventually, they, they, they eventually got enough word of God in them to get to a place of maturity where I could actually take the guy out for dinner and say, what you need to do is make an honest woman out of her. And he got it, you know, but he couldn't have got it six months earlier, a year earlier. You know, you've got mature people. Awesome. Who we are matters more than where we're going. Yes, it does. Absolutely. I said that at the beginning. Well done, Maria. Awesome. Praise God. Okay, I've got no more questions. That's nice. I'm, I'm going to assume the lack of questions means I've explained everything perfectly well and done an excellent job. Okay, so next week, we'll continue on this process of how to build maturity into the local church. We'll be very specific about church and very specific about how we can do it, not just from the preaching, not just from the, the culture, but just from just being together. And we'll talk about that. And, uh, you know, Jesus, we'll talk about Jesus a lot next week. This week's been you know, very practical, sort of, you know, we're talking about prayer or principle, things like that. But we'll get, we'll get back into the word next week and look at some of the Jesus stuff that we can all do to help create a culture of maturity. And um, I believe it will really help you. So um, I'm just trying to think of time-wise. Um, there may not be a meeting next week just because we're, we're heading right into Heal the Nations. And there certainly won't be a meeting on August the 7th because of Heal the Nations. I'm busy preaching in Dartford. Get yourself to Dartford. Get yourself to the Mercure Grand Hatch and get three days of four days of preaching. You know, get yourself 13 weeks worth of church in one, in one week. That's going to mature you. That's going to help. Awesome. Right. Love you all. Love you all so much. Thanks for all the thank yous. Loads of them coming up there. I really appreciate that. That really is 
it is good to me to be encouraged um and uh, i love you guys so much and i'll speak to you all soon hopefully to see some of you in trimley tonight and in dagenham tomorrow and in brentwood if not wherever you're going enjoy have a great time be mature be loving be kind <laughs> celebrate what needs to be celebrated amen okay love you all bye